Bugler, sound the charge. Anyone who grew up on a diet of cowboy films will have the image of the US cavalry charging over the horizon, guns ablazing, dressed in striking blue uniforms, red bandanas and yellow hats, chasing the Indians off at the last moment to save the day. In this film I am going to destroy this image, so if you're squeamish please look away. In 1865 the American Civil War ended, the country was in recession and broke. Disbanding the huge armies left over from the war was a priority and there were very few remaining roles left in the army and they were highly sought after. One of these was the worst job in the army, cavalry deployed on the plains. After the American Civil War the number of regiments deployed on the plains was increased from 6 to 10. Two of the regiments were black soldiers and these were arguably the two best. With there being an overabundance of officers Getting into a regiment was incredibly difficult and the promotion hopes terrible. After the war an estimated 88% of officers were West Point graduates and 12% enlisted men promoted during the Civil War. Between 1866 and 1890 it took roughly 25 years to get promoted from lieutenant to major. It was even more difficult for Confederate officers who often had to join as NCOs or even enlisted men. If there was too many officers there was a shortage of enlisted men. The proverbial bottom of the barrel was scraped and the nuances in the law used. One such was the fact Indian Territory was technically outside the United States so civil law didn't apply and men convicted of crimes in the US weren't criminals on the plane so on the run criminals provided an excellent source of recruits. Another was recent immigrants. On average half the troopers were recent immigrants. In numerical order the nationalities were Irish, German Austrian, Italian, British, Dutch, French, Swiss then other nationalities. To give some idea of how prevalent immigrants were of the 260 who died at the Little Bighorn 30% were Irish. The average age of a trooper was 23 and they came from quite an amazing diversity of backgrounds. US recruits could come from good families whereas immigrant motivation tended to be poverty. A company of Custer's cavalry had three professors, a doctor, a telegraph operator, a printer, two lawyers, four cooks, three school teachers, a farm labourer, a bookkeeper, a farm boy, a dentist, a blacksmith, an ivory carver, a young man of position trying to gain a commission and a salesman ruined by drink. The main problem the cavalry faced was not the Indians but desertion. Roughly one third of all soldiers deserted and companies were often as low as 50% strength. A special kind of professional deserter even emerged called snowbirds. They would join the army to see themselves through the winter then desert in summer and next year do the same again. From the 1860s right through to the late 1870s cavalry received no training other than basic drill. This is quite amazing when you consider most recruits had never seen a horse let alone ridden one. No riding training was provided whatsoever. When a trooper went on patrol perhaps this was the first time he ever rode a horse. Hopefully he would have the luxury of weeks of uneventful patrolling in agony from saddle sores to learn horsemanship skills but if he was unlucky enough to see trouble right away he had big problems. New recruits had little hope against skillful Indian riders. From 1880 proper training procedures were established. Recruits learnt shooting, marching, physical fitness exercises, riding, mounted and dismounted sabre drill. Equipment was not standardised. Cavalry were given a single uniform when they enlisted but the uniform was poor quality. It fell apart quickly and was also useless in winter cold. So most cavalry unlike Hollywood movies reverted to corduroy, buckskin or flannel scouting suits. Cavalry horses differed from Indian ponies in that they lacked both speed and stamina but were superior in that they could be ridden in winter unlike the Indian ponies. Up until 1870 there was no standardisation of weapons. A cavalry troop would have carried a mixture of sharp muzzle loading carbines, short range Spencer repeating rifles, Springfield muzzle loading rifles, Remingtons and others. Pistols were similarly mixed. 
The only standard weapon was the 1860 cavalry sabre, which was not carried on campaign. In 1870, a standardised breech-loading Allen Springfield was issued to all troops. Warfare involved mostly long rides, hunger and exhaustion, but little fighting. Encounters tended to be ambushes, with one side heavily outnumbering the other. Catching Indians on the run was almost impossible due to their superior horsemanship skills. Taking prisoners was rare for the cavalry, and being captured meant slow torture and death. So suicide was common if an action was going badly. Patrolling miles from civilization, the prospects for the wounded were grim. Five out of every thousand men died from wounding. However, disease was to prove the biggest killer of all. Twice as many cavalry died from disease as were killed by Indians. Life in the cavalry was harsh and not remotely romantic like in the movies. It was mostly for the dispossessed, criminals, the impoverished or people who couldn't adjust to normality after the American Civil War. Pay was poor and prospects virtually nero. Fights ended in either death or victory, but despite this it wasn't very dangerous, with a death rate of just over one in a thousand. 